All right, so I'm going to kick things off. We're going to talk about post-harvest practices to get the longest shelf life from your crops. And when I was in grad school, that's what I did. I was a post-harvest physiologist, so I still do a lot of that. So after this session, you should be able to recognize post-harvest practices to help you maintain the highest quality and distinguish the crop characteristics that are going to affect your management choices and select your best storage temperatures. This is the fun part. So as you probably all know, quality can't be improved once you harvest. It's only going to go downhill from there. So we want to make sure that we're harvesting at the highest quality and then we're going to maintain that quality for the longest amount of time possible. And high quality produce really starts before you put anything into the ground. So it's going to start with your sound production practices and then making sure you're, har you're handling things properly after they're harvested and then having good handling and storage. So really, your quality is going to start with your variety selection. And if you've been growing fruits or vegetables for a long time, you probably have your favorite apple varieties and you probably have your favorite vegetable varieties that you grow. And a lot of that often comes down to the quality that you're getting. We have all of these tomatoes that have really thick skins and that's because of the way our food system tends to go now. We ship things across the country and those thick skins help us maintain better quality from one place to another. But now with local foods and things, we look for things such as the flavor a lot more and other characteristics that go into that quality as well. And these are all things that you think about before you buy your seeds. And it's always good as growers to do little variety tests on your own farm to find out what works best for you, not only from consumer perspective, but things that are going to hold up better for you than others. And the same thing is true of disease and pest resistance. So one strategy for always having a certain crop is to grow multiple varieties because while you might like one variety the best, if you put all your eggs in one basket, the insects might also like that variety the best too. So if you diversify, it's a good strategy, even among the same crop, to help make sure that you'll have a good harvest. Another thing we look at is uniformity. That's more in a wholesale market that folks want a uniform shape and size. Direct markets are often much more forgiving than the wholesale market there. And then, of course, shelf life is important to you as it's important to your clients. So for shelf life, oftentimes people think, if I can get it out the door, that's all I'm concerned about. But you want to make sure it's going to last as long as it can for your customer as well. So you want to match the variety to your market. And then, of course, there's things that are outside of your control, like the environment. And it's going to come down to the soil type that you have, and that goes into the quality of your produce, as well as the temperature and frost and rainy weather at harvest. Again, most of these things are beyond your control, but if you're just looking for a farm, soil type is one that you can have a little control over there. And then your cultural practices are going to affect your quality as well. So things like growing on plastic mulch versus bare ground, you're not going to get that soil splashing up into the canopy, so it's going to keep your crop cleaner, number one and then it can reduce disease over time as well because you're not going to get spores that will splash up from the soil into the canopy too. And then things like trellising to allow for airflow through the crop. High tunnels are another great way to improve or maintain quality because you're going to keep the rain off that crop and you're going to be the one that is in, in control of when it gets water and when it doesn't. And generally if you have a high tunnel you're going to have drip tape there on the ground which is going to keep the water right in the root zone where we want it. And then your tools and equipment. Keeping your tools and, and knives well sharpened goes a long way for post-harvest quality. Because if you have a knife that's getting a little dull, that's going to make all the cuts that you do have a much bigger wound than if you have a really sharp knife. And so that's really an easy one that folks can keep up with. It's hard in the middle of the season to make sure those knives are sharp all the time, but it's really important for post-harvest quality, especially on things like lettuces that are going to bruise really easily. And then your post-harvest handling. Of course, we want to make sure that we're handling everything as gently as possible. I talked a little bit about irrigation practices a second ago with the high tunnels, but when you were using drip irrigation in a system instead of overhead irrigation, you're going to keep your crop canopy drier, and that's going to go a long way for your quality as well. So we want to keep it right in the root zone. It's also going to help to have the maximum efficiency of the water that you're using so you can actually use less water. And then mechanical injury. That's always going to happen when you're harvesting lots of things, but we want to try to keep that to a minimum as well. 
So of course we want to maintain high standards. Oftentimes if we have a garden we would take these things, cut off the blossom end rot there on that one or cut off this end of the corn. But if you're selling it, this is really a reputation and you want to make sure you have the highest quality produce on the market. We have a grower that comes to the market and he always says you can tell it's organic because every ear of corn has a worm in it. It seems to work well for him. He gets about a dollar for each ear of corn, but it's all in your image and what you want to project in the, in the community and have people coming back. It does add protein too, so that's a bonus. So when is it time to harvest? Most crops we're going to harvest on, based on size and maturity, and we actually want to harvest most things slightly immature instead of letting them get fully mature, because they're going to have better quality and better shelf life if we let, pick them when they're slightly immature. If we pick them too early, of course, they're not going to be big enough. They're going to have insufficient size, and it's also going to affect their sugar and vitamin content. So we want to maximize the sugar in our crops like melons and strawberries and such, and also the vitamin content. But if we harvest them too late, we get too much fiber. Think of an okra pod that you let go a couple days too long. Or we're going to start converting that sugar into starch. Think of sweet corn. When we get that starch going instead of that nice sweet flavor, it's kind of like an ear of field corn instead of an ear of sweet corn. And then it's going to decrease plant productivity because what's the purpose of that plant? Is it to give us food? It's to make seeds and reproduce itself, right? So if it's doing that and you're letting those seeds get mature in whatever crop it is, that's going to decrease the plant productivity overall because it thinks its job is done and it has those mature seeds that are ready to reproduce. And it's also going to potentially attract pests. So we want to keep that in mind as well. So this is just a quick list of things we generally pick immature and things we would wait and pick vine ripe. So things like bell peppers, cucumbers we're going to pick immature. You know if you pick a mature cucumber it's going to be about the size of a baseball bat and very bitter. Same thing with the summer squash. Snap beans and sweet peas and okra and eggplant and sweet corn. Those are all things we're going to pick on the immature side. And then the mature are going to be things like our tomatoes, red peppers, musk melons, cantaloupes, watermelons. Any of the melons, if we're picking them early, they're going to be green. They're not going to have that sugar content developed there. And berries, we want to pick mature. We're not going to go through this uh, individually, but you have several slides on when is the correct time to harvest crops. We'll go through a few of these that I think um, get people tripped up sometimes. A lot of them are just the desirable size. That's true of okra, so you want a little three to four inch pod that's still tender. Um, musk melons, and these can be a little tricky because musk melons, a lot of types you want to wait till they do what we call slip off the vine so you can e easily take them off that stem. However, newer varieties of musk melons are long shelf life types to give you longer shelf life, obviously. And with those, they're never going to slip. If you let them slip, they're going to be very over mature. So if anybody's growing that type of melon, you want to make sure that you know the harvest indices for that, which is just when you're starting to get netting on that stem. You will get a long shelf life out of them, but if you wait till they slip, they're going to be extremely over mature. Watermelon's another one that's very tricky to harvest for a lot of folks. And if you're musically inclined, they say you can hear the difference between the ping and the pong, and that's how you know when a watermelon's ripe. But for those of us that are tone deaf, this is a pretty reliable method as long as your vines aren't overrun with disease. If you look at the first tendril, that little curly cue that's closest to the melon and the first leaf, and if they've both turned brown, it's a pretty good indicator that that melon's going to be ripe. Also, you usually get a creamy yellow spot on the bottom of the melon, and you're not going to be able to see the striping pattern if it's a striped rind. And that's another good indicator that a watermelon's ripe. Um, in this set, we have the true vegetables here. The other ones were botanically fruit crops, but with the true vegetables, it's generally the size. And um, with cauliflower and broccoli that's flower, that are both flowering parts that we eat, you just want to make sure that things are nice and compact and full. We're going to talk about harvesting and temperature now. So we have excellent temperate weather here in Tennessee 
And for a lot of our root crops, we can leave them in the ground throughout the winter if they're mulched nicely. And that can be our storage of those and just harvest them as you need them. We have a uh, farm in Middle Tennessee that does a winter CSA and they do a half acre of carrots and they just leave them in the ground and pick them as they need them out of the ground. The sweetest carrots you'll ever eat. And we're lucky because our soil generally doesn't freeze solid. Here, you're up in higher elevation in these parts, so you would have a little more trouble with this than we would, say, farther west in Tennessee. But the cool temperature is also going to help improve flavor on these crops. And this is something you could throw a row cover over up here, and it would be fine as well. So we know from this weekend that a frost occurs from 32 to 36. A light freeze is going to be 28 to 31, and then a moderate freeze and a severe freeze is going to be right around 24 to 28 and below 24 degrees. So as long as we're not going to have a really cold temperatures for a sustained period of time, these things can all be stored in the ground. And that's the other thing when we're talking about harvests and temperatures, the time that something's going to be at a particular temperature is going to make a big difference. And this is true of outside weather as well as temperature in your cooler. And we'll talk about that a little bit more when we're talking later on on storage. So we're going to go through a few harvest tips. And with the harvest tips, some of these tend to contradict each other. So it's going to be using as most common sense and what works for your farm. If you have a farmer's market first thing Saturday morning, you know, it's going to dictate when you're going to harvest that crop. So the first one is to train your help on how to pick. And this one's really important. When we're doing food safety talks, we often talk about standard operating procedures and things that you think are common sense and second nature to you might not be what somebody else would do. So you want to make sure with everything you do on your farm that you give your workers really explicit instructions. And when we're talking about these standard operating procedures, these are things we write out and you hand them this piece of paper and then you watch them do it. And if they're not doing it the way that you would do it, you want to make sure that you go back and tweak that because you're not going to be there all the time to be watching them, so you want to make sure they're doing it the way you want them to do it. And that's true of harvesting as much as anything else. This is the one, harvest in the morning hours. That's not always possible, but in the morning, the plants are going to have the most turgor, so they're going to have the, the highest firmness for your crop. All that water is going to be inside the crop instead of later in the afternoon when things are starting to get a little wilted down. But we also want to harvest dry, so here's that contradiction. We're not going to have a dry crop in the morning, but if you harvest dry, you have less of a chance with the moisture on the crop to spread diseases from one plant to another. So that's what that harvesting dry is about. And then this is a big one, keep the produce out of the sun. Your field might not be where you will pack your produce, so you want to make sure that you've thought about keeping it out of the sun while you're out there harvesting everything else. And depending on the crop, that can make a really big difference. For something like a strawberry, even sitting out for a half hour to an hour is going to start to reduce the shelf life on something like that. So you want to make sure, even in the field, that you have a tarp or some other way to keep it shaded while you're, while you're out there harvesting if you're not taking it out of the field right away. Then you want to handle everything with care to reduce bruising. Move everything to cold storage if you have it as soon as possible because temperature is really the largest factor in your quality and your storage life. And then you want to make sure that you're not commingling damaged produce with high quality produce. And you want to use clean and sanitized harvest bins and you don't want to handle anything more than you need to. So if you can field pack your crops and not touch them again, once you're getting them out of the field, the better off you'll be. Another one that's not up here is to make sure that you are getting your calls out of the field. Oftentimes, as we go through the field, we harvest the good stuff and we see a rotten berry or something and we throw it in the row. We don't want to do that. You want to have a call bucket and you want to get that out of the field because if you're leaving that berry that has spores in your field and the wind blows, you just spread it to a whole lot of other plants. So you want to get the calls out. You don't want to just throw them in the row. You want to get them totally out of the field and if you have a compost pile, to the compost pile. All right, so what do you see in this picture that's good and what might not be so good? Shade. Shade, so that's good. What might not be so good about this picture? If we're thinking about food safety. Right under the tree like that? 
being right under the tree because we could have squirrels up there or birds roosting. And if they make a deposit, that's going right on your crop. So it's great that they have this in the shade, but if they tarped it or had another means to cover that fruit so it's not right under the tree, that would be a little better. Someone else at another workshop that we did said they're also having compression injury from one layer to the other. All right, harvesting tools and equipment. I already talked about having really sharp knives and pruners and how that goes a long way for the quality of your produce. If you looked under a microscope at a head of lettuce after it's chopped, you would see a vast difference between a dull knife and a sharp knife on that head of lettuce. Harvesting totes and bins. You want to make sure you have harvesting totes and bins that are easy to clean and that you can regularly clean, don't have a lot of nooks and crannies. I had somebody emailing me last week about harvest bins that she likes that fold up really nicely and flatten out in between harvests, and those are good, but they do have a lot more nooks and crannies because you have all those folds in them and areas where things can collect. If you have a standard plastic bin, even if it's something like this Rubbermaid bin over here, those are very easy to clean out and sanitize on a week-to-week -week basis. Then if you have any brushes, you want to think about those. Spray bottles for sanitizer and water. Spray bottles are great if you're in a farmer's market setting so you can spritz your greens to keep them nice and looking fresh. And then you want to think about your packing shed and cooler as well if you're going to have either of those on your farm. So here's those harvest containers. They should be clean, have smooth inside surfaces and free of rough edges. The stackable plastic crates, they are an investment. They're not cheap, but they will last for many years. I think we've had ours going on about 10 years now, and they're still going strong. They tend to disappear because everybody thinks they're very convenient to have, and so they walk off the farm. But otherwise, we haven't had any trouble with them breaking, and they're real easy to stack and, and clean. Of course, everything should be packed and unpacked with care. Um, wood, we want to try to minimize on the farm because wood cannot be cleaned. Wood, being a, living or a formerly living organism, has all those cells, and so those are great nooks and crannies for bacteria and dirt and debris. Here, this is just showing that on the corner of this lug, it's getting muddy in the field. These are farms, so we are aware of that. What we do on our farm, we have our bins and they fit into a nice little wagon, so they never, at the bottom of our bins never touch the ground. They're in the wagon, we roll the wagon down the row and harvest everything, and then we can carry everything into the packing house, and the bottom of those bins stay clean, and we don't have to worry about contamination from soil on the bottom of them. Field packing. As I mentioned, this is going to reduce the steps in your handling chain, and that's going to reduce your potential damage to your crop overall. It's really good for soft fruits, so any of your berries, if you can field pack them, as well as your leafy crops, because they're going to get damaged just from your fingers touching them. A small cart can help reduce the amount of bending and lifting for the picker, and so you want to think about the ergonomics and your workers as well as the crop. And these are just other ways that you can reduce the contact of the field container with the soil. So they have these um, little carts here that go in the field and they put the container on top of it there for those strawberries. And here's some of the carts that you can have throughout the field. Um, we just bought ours from Tractor Supply and they're nice because the sides go down as well. So if it's something heavy, you don't have to lift it up over the cart. You can just pull it right off the side. The other thing you can do, which is a little more fancy, is a movable cart that you might have pulled by a small tractor, depending on what your setup is, or it can be pulled by a horse in the field during your harvest. And if you have this little roof set up, that gives you shade under that cart the whole time that you're out there harvesting, and it's going to open up and provide shade for your workers as well, which in a nice summer Tennessee day, it's nice to have shade under there while you're loading the boxes on there. These are more examples of shade and mobility. So it doesn't have to be anything fancy. These pop-up tents are great. We use these a lot in our variety trials and we're gonna be out there all day. It makes a big difference to be under a little pop-up tent and that's something that you can carry with you in the back of the truck and put up wherever you need it. Um, here's an example of a cart that has those fold-up sides. And then here's a bigger cart, again under a tree there, and a little gator. 
So any lightweight stands and trailers and golf carts you can use and pop-up tents. Anything that make it a little easier. Packaging can be really important because depending on the crop, it can reduce your physical damage to the produce. It's going to make the produce easier to handle. American Vegetable Grower Magazine always has an issue every year um, that has a good source of suppliers. It usually comes out in the winter, about a couple months from now. And so you can check there for good sources of packaging supplies. You also want to take into consideration whether it's a wet or dry product. So you know if you need a wax box or a non-wax box. Wax boxes are great if you're going to do any icing of your produce for things like broccoli or if you're going to do any water cooling. Usually we just get a regular old 20 to 25 pound cardboard box for tomatoes, peppers, and things like peaches. And then we get the pint to quart boxes or gallon buckets for berries and cherries and tomatoes and mini peppers. Cherry tomatoes and mini peppers. Now we're going to talk about the different tenets of post-harvest handling. So we're going to talk about respiration, transpiration, temperature, and relative humidity. Respiration is the process by which the food reserves in that crop are going to be oxidized to produce energy and keep that fruit or vegetable alive. So as soon as we harvest that crop, we've taken it away from its life source, right? If we've cut it off the plant, it no longer has the roots, it's no longer getting water, it's no longer getting food from the roots of the plant. So again, you can only maintain the quality that you have when you pick it, and it's going to go downhill from there because essentially it's dying once we remove it from the plant. And that continued respiration that it does after we harvest it is going to result in the deterioration of the nutrients as well as the texture, and it's going to contribute to water loss and flavor loss as well. And the respiration rates vary greatly by commodity, and we'll look at that in the next slide, but really once you harvest that crop, the clock is ticking. So for things that don't have a high water content, like nuts and dates, they're going to have a very low respiration rate, and that correlates with what their perishability is. We know that we can keep nuts and dates for a long time because of that low water content. They're going to last for months, if not longer. Things like apples, citrus, and potatoes, again, low respiration rate. We can stick them in the fruit cellar, and they're going to last a good six to nine months or more if they're in good temperature and good quality when we stick them in the storage. And then garlic, onions, and carrots, they're going to be moderate on that respiration and moderate perishability. And then as we start to get to the other end, things like tomatoes and peaches and strawberries and broccoli, they're going to have higher respiration rates and a shorter shelf life. And then the really high ones there, the asparagus and the sweet corn and the peas. And we know this from, from having these crops and on the farm that we need to get them and move them. And again, the sweet corn is one, if we don't, get it in the chain very quickly, it's going to get really starchy and chewy and it's not going to have good eating quality to it. So transpiration, which goes along with that respiration, is the process of losing water to the environment. So any time when we have produce, it's going to be 80 to 90 percent water and the atmosphere isn't going to be as high generally, have as high relative humidity, so that's going to draw the water out of that commodity into the air. So after harvest, we're no longer pulling that water up from the roots, and we're going to get water loss that's going to cause wilting and shriveling and softening, as well as overall weight loss. So this becomes important for growers if you're selling things by weight at a farmer's market or in any market, because if you're losing water, you're losing profit out of your pocket. It's also going to affect the crispness and juiciness and the nutritional quality and flavor. Temperature is going to be the most important factor in maintaining your quality throughout the time that you have that product. So again, the cooler you can get that crop as soon as you harvest. If you have a cooler, sticking it in that cooler is going to be great to keeping that quality high. But you also want to remove or prevent it from building up that field heat as much as possible. So that comes back to wanting to harvest things in the morning when the field heat hasn't built up yet because then you have less heat to remove overall. And then you want to remember that fruits and vegetables are alive. So that heat that they're exposed to is going to increase that water loss, increase their respiration. Just like when you're on the treadmill, 
it's increasing your water loss and your respiration. Same thing with fruits and vegetables. So we want to minimize that heat. And the higher the storage temperature, the shorter your shelf life is going to be. Relative humidity goes along with that temperature storage. And this is the measure to the degree of which the air is saturated with water vapor. So we tend to have a nice humid environment in Tennessee. And a normal spring, summer day, we can get up around the 75% range, which is pretty high compared to other regions of the country. But still, it's going to be lower than the relative humidity in that piece of fruit. So we want to maintain the water in the fruit instead of bringing it out into the air. That water loss is going to depend on the difference between what's in that crop and what's in the surrounding air around here. And then the surface characteristics of, a, of the produce. So a leafy crop with all that surface area and all those leaves everywhere is going to lose water a lot faster than something like an apple that is more compact, has less surface area, has a nice waxy cuticle on the outside of it. So it's going to maintain its water in there way better, which is another reason why we have a longer shelf life on something like an apple versus lettuce. So the higher you can make the relative humidity wherever you're storing it, the, you'll help with that shelf life as well. What, the other thing we need to be careful of when we're increasing the humidity is we don't want to encourage disease. So we don't want to have condensation forming on the fruit and making a really nice environment for disease organisms that may be present. But we want to make sure that we're maintaining that high humidity so we're keeping the turgor in that fruit or vegetable crop. And a good sanitation program along with those cool temperatures can help prevent disease. And when we're talking about food safety, it's never just generally for food safety's sake, but there's always a bonus to the quality of your crop as well. So anytime you're keeping the temperatures cooler, that's uh, discouraging both foodborne illness pathogens as well as plant pathogens from growing on that crop. So you're going to have less decay and less chance of foodborne illness risk. Um, buckets of water are good to put in a cold room or even a humidifier can help increase that relative humidity if it's a crop that's really sensitive to water loss. Anytime you have post-harvest injury, that's a good way to reduce your yields. If it's mishandled, we can have impact injury. If something's thrown or dropped or dumped and it's landing on a hard surface, so you want to be aware of how far things have to drop if you have a, a packing line that's automated. Um, you also want to think about compression injury. So we like to stack everything in and get the most out of our bins, but we want to make sure that we're not overstacking things so they're going to be prone to compression injury. And then abrasion injury. Depending on how far you have to travel to get that product to the market, you want to be aware, and this is where packaging comes in handy again. You want to think about the packaging, especially if you have those nice heirloom tomatoes with the thinner skin and that tend to be softer. If they have to go a long way and it's a bumpy road, you're going to tend to get more abrasion injury than if you just have to go down the block or to your roadside stand to market those. So you also want to think about rubbing against each other or on conveyor belts and the walls of the packing line. This is another area, the abrasion injury, where it comes in very handy to make sure that your workers know exactly how you want things harvested. If you're growing tomatoes and you're not removing the stems on those tomatoes, that's a great place for abrasion injury to occur when you try to move them or even when you're just putting them in the bin. If the stems are still on your tomatoes, that stem's going to poke the next tomato next to it. And that's something that oftentimes people don't think about because they think, oh, the stem looks pretty on there. Another thing about stems, leaving them on if they're easily removed, is stems on a tomato is going to be the first thing that dries out. So while that stem might look nice right when you're harvesting it, it's going to poke the next tomato, and it's going to get dried out and dark green pretty quickly. So you want to think about that as well. As I already mentioned, if you have punctures or bruises, that's going to give entry for not only those foodborne illness pathogens, but also plant pathogens. So proper harvesting and culling is really important for the safety and quality of your product. And any cuts, bruises, or scrapes is going to help promote decay on that crop. Excessive moisture is also going to promote decay. Over maturity is going to promote decay. And cooling is going to slow all of that down.
oftentimes, how many people have a cooler or some way to cool on their farm? Does anybody? So a few of you. Yeah, so room cooling is just any sort of insulated room that's equipped with a refrigerator. That's going to be the slowest method of cooling that we have. It's going to take the longest amount of time, but it's better than not having a cooler. And for small diversified growers, setting up a cold room can be very expensive. How many folks have heard of a cool bot that you can put onto an air conditioning unit? That's a great way to go for a cooler. It will get you as cool as you need to be. Generally, you're not storing these things for a long period of time on your farm. So as long as you can get that field heat out before you're taking it to the market, it's going to help you be better off. A cool bot is just a little device that goes on a window air conditioning unit, and it lets you override the lowest setting on that air conditioning unit. So you can get a room down to about 50 degrees, a little 10 by 10 room. Lots of folks like to put these in trailers, so they have their cooling trailer. And then if they're at the market and they have an electrical hookup, that can, they can keep everything cool while they're at market as well. Forced air coolers we see less, but they can be something as simple as having a fan going over the produce as well. This will greatly increase um, the, or lessen the time that it takes to cool things. Um, it's just pulling that cold air through the produce, whatever it might be. And in a large setup, these would be very big sheets that you have and very large fans that blow the air through pallets and pallets of produce. The great thing about forced air cooling is it's very efficient. The bad thing about forced air cooling is water loss, transpiration. It's going to increase that transpiration. So it's a double-edged sword. You want to use this wisely with crops that aren't going to uh, wilt quickly. You wouldn't want to use that with any leafy crops. Hydro cooling, this is just giving the produce a shower with cold water. Not appropriate for all vegetables. We see this with big sweet corn operations oftentimes. And then top or liquid icing, we see this a lot with broccoli and the, the flower crops, cauliflower, broccoli. And this is just adding Christ, crushed ice to the box of produce. It's also good for sweet corn as well because those are those high respiration crops. So if you have a lot of that crop together, like in a box, that respiration is going to build up heat over time. So if we can keep that heat out, we'll have higher quality. And then vacuum cooling. This one we do see every once in a while, not very common in Tennessee, but we do have some vacuum coolers around. This is more common in California where you see a lot of vacuum coolers, but it's really going to force the water to evaporate and remove the heat from that crop. It's one that is good for leafy crops because it's very, very quick. So you're not going to have the risk of wilting and water loss there as much. So when we're talking about post-harvest water quality, the, we want to make sure that any water that we're using post-harvest has no detectable generic E. coli in the water for a 100 milliliter sample. So this is something you can take a sample of the water you're using and you can send it off to the lab. There's several labs around Tennessee that can do this test for you. But you want to make sure that your water source is free of generic E. coli. And if you're in a municipality, you can get a report from your municipality every year that has this test in it, but a lot can happen from that municipality to your farm. So it'd still be a good idea for you to test your water in, that you're using for post-harvest uses and make sure right where it's coming out of the spigot and you're using it that it has zero generic E. coli in it. And this is water that we're using for washing or cooling or dipping or icing any sort of processing that you're doing, and any direct contact with your produce. And this is true of where you're washing your hands as well. So these are a list of crops that can be iced and crops that will be damaged by ice. We don't need to go over those in any detail. Any sort of berry crop, we don't want to get any water on it until the customer is going to directly wash it and eat it because any water that you get on strawberries, blueberries, raspberries, or um, blackberries, that's going to just promote decay. And uh, we did a workshop, I think last year, and it was a blackberry and raspberry grower. And he said, well, I've been washing everything. He said, you just saved me a lot of time. And I said, well, I probably saved you quality too because while it looks good when you wash it and put it up there, that's going to greatly reduce the shelf life for your customer and they're going to get home and it's going to start to mold within days if you've washed it. 
whereas we would hope to get a, at least a week out of it, maybe more, depending on the crop. So we want to keep those dry as much as possible. Some vegetables are going to get what we call chilling injury if they're stored between 45 and 55 degrees Fahrenheit. And again, the time that they're stored at that temperature is going to make a difference as well. If you have one cooler on your farm and you mainly grow things that aren't chilling sensitive that are best stored at 32 degrees and something's going to be in there for a couple hours, it's not going to hurt it. All you're going to do is help get that field heat out of it if there's any field heat in it. But if you're storing things where they're going to actually reach this temperature, 45 to 55 degrees, then you want to be careful and you want to be aware of what the main crops are you're growing and keep the cooler at the temperature that's best for the majority of the crops that you grow. The highly sensitive crops are going to be things like basil and cucumbers and eggplant and pumpkins and summer squash, okra and sweet potatoes. And if you've ever had basil in your refrigerator, you know that it turns black pretty quickly. And that's the chilling injury that you're seeing there. Same thing with bananas. Not that we grow a lot of bananas in Tennessee, but you'll know if you put a banana in the refrigerator, it's going to get that black skin on it pretty quick. And that's a sign of a chilling injury on the skin. But the nice thing about a banana is, if you have a particular stage where you like to eat your bananas, if you stick it in the refrigerator, that's going to stop it from maturing any further. So you can kind of, it'll look gross on the outside, but it'll stop it at that maturity stage. That's a fun little trick. A good party conversation thing there. Moderately sensitive crops to uh, chilling injury are going to be things like snap beans and muskmelons and peppers and winter squash and tomatoes. So you'll notice that these crops that are chilling sensitive, they're a lot of our warm season crops. So they're not going to like it in the cold as well as our cool season crops do. And these are just some symptoms of chilling injury. So you can see on the beans, you get this pitting and they turn brown. You see the little marks there. Same thing on this cucumber, that's chilling injury there, all those pits in the skin. There are also, some crops are going to get internal discoloration or they're going to fail, fail to ripen all together. We've all had a tomato that's been in the refrigerator. Doesn't taste very good. It, it really damages the flavor of that crop as well. And it's going to make it more susceptible to decay. So again, it's going to shorten our shelf life overall. For many vegetables, marketing is, washing is essential prior to marketing that crop. And we want to make sure that, again, we have a plentiful source of clean water. If you are washing anything, you want to make sure that you're changing that water often. And people always say, well, how often should I be changing it? It's going to depend on what you're growing, how dirty it is, and how much of it you're running through that water. So it's not something we can tell you for every farm. It's going to be very specific for your farm and your crops that you're growing. If at all possible, don't wash things. Because as we've talked about, once you're getting that crop wet, that's going to introduce the potential for more decay and also risks from the food safety side. So if you can keep it dry, all the better. If you have a buyer that wants you to specifically wash it, then you're going to need to wash it before you're selling it. For some things like potatoes and beets and carrots that are going to be heavily soiled, brushing may be necessary. For leafy greens, again, if you can get away without washing them, don't wash them. But if you need to wash them, you want to make sure that they're as thoroughly drained as possible before you're storing them in a bag or, or um, putting them in another container. You don't want to wash any damaged or diseased produce with everything else because, again, that's going to run the risk of cross-contamination with healthy and high-quality produce. And your water should have a sanitizer, which we'll talk about in detail in a little bit. The next thing you need to think about, depending on what crops you're growing, is that bacteria can actually enter through this stem scar with improper handling or your wash water management. So if you're dunking tomatoes, in a bin of water and that tomato, you're sticking it in cool water because you're thinking, ooh, I can do two for one and I can cool it down while I'm getting it clean. That water can actually get sucked in through that stem scar. So anything in that water, and that includes bacteria, can go right inside that fruit instead of being in the water or on the outside of the fruit. So you want to make sure if you are washing things in a dumping situation for things like tomatoes and apples as well, that the fruit pulp temperature must be less than 10 degrees warmer than the water temperature. So if you're harvesting these in the afternoon and the tomatoes are fairly warm, you want to make sure that your water 
is no less than 10 degrees within that 10 degree range of the of the temperature of the tomato. So you don't. Uh, you can stick a thermometer in one. You can sacrifice it, or you'll you can ballpark it. I mean, it's not that critical. You just know if you have a warm fruit, you don't want to be sticking it in ice cold water because you're going to run the risk of sucking anything in that water into the fruit. And that's again where a sanitizer can be handy. Yes. Of a tomato? Yeah. Like what I still want to practice it. Yes. You would. Yeah. Yeah. Because there's space around there that it can still get through. You don't have the, you know, it's not, it's not like it's a perfect seal on the stem. So. All right. Crops that you don't want to wash before market. We've already talked about the berries, spinach, and other greens, unless they're really overly dirty. Oftentimes we do get dirt and sand down in the cracks. And so, Oftentimes, folks want to wash those so their customer doesn't have to do it. Um, but from a food safety standpoint, if you can tell the customer, hey, we haven't washed this, so you get the maximum shelf life off of this, you want to wash it when you get home, then they know, and that's part of it. Now when we buy berries in the grocery store, it always says that inside the clamshell, wash before eating, this hasn't been washed. So it's the same thing if you get that general idea into your customer's head that they want to take it home and wash it, it's really to their benefit because they're going to have a longer shelf life and it's going to save you some time as well. Basil's another one we don't want to wash and summer squash. For a lot of the wholesale summer squash people, the buyers want them to wash it, but what does summer squash have all over it? It has those hairs, right, or the trichomes on it. So when you're washing those, you're rubbing all those off and every place you rub one of those off, that's just another place where you're going to have water loss. So if you don't have to wash those, again, don't wash them. But a lot of people do require that, buyers do, if you're growing a lot of summer squash. But it's going to reduce the shelf life overall. We have a publication on enhancing the safety of locally grown produce that we did for another project. And Faith, we don't have those in here, do we? No. Okay. We can get you the link for this. But if you Google storage of fresh produce and UTK, enhancing the safety of locally grown produce, it should pop up. But this gives you a whole list of crops. This is not the whole list, as you might guess. But it gives you the ideal storage temperature for the crop and then the shelf life at that ideal storage temperature. So it just gives you a ballpark. Again, we realize you don't have multiple cold rooms on your farm if you're growing a variety of things. And it's going to be the best uh, for everything that you're growing. You know what you're growing and you know what the temperature should be and how long you're holding things. So this is just to give you a good indicator of where they should, how long they should be stored at different temperatures. And this is useful if you're doing a CSA and you have crops that do store for a number of weeks or something to give you an idea of how long you might be able to store them, how many boxes they might go, from, go into from one harvest. Cooling we already talked about. Uh, little bit on the pre-cooling side. For cold rooms, they're going to help prolong your shelf life from hours to weeks, depending on the crop. You want to make sure that they're large enough to handle backups of product if you're not moving things as quickly as you might think you might. And they can be used or new walk-in cold rooms. And again, you can DIY them by using that cool bot. And there's the picture of the cool bot there. And this one's down to 34. And it just goes on a, ref on a window air conditioning unit there. You can use old shipping containers or railway cars and many ways to build your own cold room on the farm and very useful to have. This is an example of things if you do have two coolers, what you would store at 32 and what you would store at 50 degrees. So again, this is going to be your chilling sensitive crops over here and this is going to be your, your things that are non-chilling sensitive. You'll see on the left-hand side of that 32, we talked about not putting melons too cold for chilling injury. If things are completely ripe, they're going to be less prone to chilling injury than if they're immature. So a red tomato um, can withstand a little cooler temperature than a green tomato could. So you also want to be aware of the maturity of that crop as well. Another way to prolong your shelf life for certain crops is curing. So curing is going to thicken the skin, which is going to help it survive in storage longer. 
It's going to reduce the moisture loss once you have that thickened skin, and it's going to give it better protection against insects and microbes. So there's a lot of things that curing can do. We're going to cure things like onions and garlic, and these you want to leave the roots and leaves attached because that's going to prevent that entry of things when they're fresh, and you're going to protect them from sun and rain in a nice well-ventilated area, and you're going to cure them for about two weeks at 80 to 90 degrees. Then you, your tops can be cut off after they're cured. Oftentimes we can cure onions and garlic in the field, but you want to make sure that it's not going to get rain on it, so you want to be, get it out if you do have a rainstorm coming in. Potatoes are going to cure at a much cooler temperature. We're going to cure them for five to ten days, and we only want the temperature to be about 59 to 68 degrees. So unlike the other two, the onions and the garlic and the sweet potatoes, we're going to cool them at a low temperature but we want really high humidity where we're going to be curing those potatoes. So 90 to 95% humidity. And then sweet potatoes, we're going to cure them for about four to seven days at about 85 to 90 degrees. Again, 85 to 90% relative humidity. So that's going to give us those thick skins on the potatoes and the sweet potatoes. Ethylene. We know that ethylene is good for ripening. It's called the ripening hormone but it also increases our susceptibility to disease. So we want to minimize ethylene, and there are crops that are ethylene producers and ethylene sensitive crops. We want to keep them separated in storage areas as much as possible, because if we don't, we're going to reduce the shelf life on those ethylene sensitive crops. And you've all heard the saying, one bad apple spoils the whole bunch, and ethylene's the reason why, because once you have a piece of produce that's decaying, it's going to produce more ethylene, which is going to contribute to the decay of everything around it. So this is a list of ethylene producers, things like apples and apricots, avocados and bananas, cantaloupe and honeydew and peaches and pears. So a lot of the true fruits are on this list. And then a lot of these on the ethylene sensitive list are going to be the true vegetables. So if we're eating another part of the plant besides the fruit part of the plant. So asparagus, where we're eating stems and snap beans. Broccoli, we're eating the flowers. And Brussels sprouts, we're eating the little leafy head there. So a lot of those leafy things will be ethylene sensitive. And you've all seen ethylene sensitivity in action. If you've seen russeting on a head of lettuce, that's ethylene that causes that rusty color on the, the bottom of lettuce. Um, the next thing we want to do is make sure that you're protecting your produce all the way through that chain until you get it to where your market is. So if you're not the one that's moving that produce, if you have a truck that comes to your farm and hauls things off, you want to make sure that you're inspecting that truck prior to loading to ensure that it's clean. You also want to identify any prior loads that might have been hauled in that truck. Of course, trucks that have hauled raw manure are a big no-no for food safety because that is a big risk for cross-contamination. We often have folks that say, oh, I know that they hauled raw chicken in this truck before they came to pick up my produce. That's another one we don't want. You want to make sure that you're looking out. They always say they use coffee to mask the smell of things that were in a truck before, so that's kind of a red flag if the truck smells like coffee before it gets to you. But even if you're the one hauling it, you don't often have multiple trucks on your farm. You don't often have one that's dedicated just to moving that produce. So you might be taking your dog to the vet in the same truck that you're moving that produce in, and you want to be thinking about that before you're putting your produce in there. You want to think about what else you did in that truck that day. And you might have been hauling your compost or manure, and then you're moving that produce through. So you want to be cognizant of all those things that you're using that truck for and make sure it's clean prior to moving produce in it. You also want to document the truck temperature if it's not your own, and then you want to look at the state of the product at the time that it was shipped. Oftentimes for bigger folks, um, they put temperature sensors right in a load, so they know that when it left their farm what the temperature was, and then they can track it. So when it gets to the buyer and the buyer says, I'm rejecting this load, this produce doesn't look good, and they can say, this is what it looked like when it left my farm, and this was the temperature. It was something along the way, and that's more and more important. If you're just thinking about putting in a packing house, an unloading dock can be essential. It can help the work that's associated with handling at the destination, and it can allow for more rapid transfer. 
of your containers with less bending, which all farm workers always appreciate. And then you want to think about handling at the destination. Again, it's important to avoid any rough handling, minimize the number of handling steps, and maintain the lowest temperature that you can. But if you're going to a farmer's market, they always say that's a good marketing tool is to be moving your produce because people are more inclined to buy from people that look busy than people that are just sitting around at the farmer's market. It does have the added benefit that if you did travel a ways and you can resort when you get there to make sure that you have the highest quality stuff out on your stand. So it'll help you look busy and it'll also uh, help you to call out anything that might have gotten damaged on the way to the market. Oftentimes outdoor markets suffer from lack of temperature control and high air circulation. If you have a choice where to be at the farmer's market, you want to think strategically about booth positioning and choose that location carefully. All right, so a lot of this material was taken from a book called Small Scale Post-Harvest Handling Practices. It's from the University of California. And additional information came from the National GAPS program at Cornell. And then ATRA has a great publication on post-harvest handling of fruits and vegetables. So just to wrap it all up, the quality and shelf life of your produce is influenced by your post-harvest handling. Poor practices during the post-harvest handling can make your crop vulnerable to foodborne illnesses as well as decay. And the temperature, the humidity, the ethylene, producing and sensitive crops should be considered when you're figuring out where you want to store and what temperature you're going to store everything at. Here's a few more references there at the end.